All right, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to February 25th uh, MakerDAO community call. My name is David Utrobin. Uh, I work for the Maker Foundation doing community development, and I get to have the pleasure of facilitating these calls every Tuesday. Uh, and and so if you've never been on this call and you're wondering what it's about, we like to cover kind of like the universe uh, at MakerDAO, what's been going on for the last week usually, but since last week's call was canceled, uh, today, I'm actually going to be going over the last kind of two weeks of what's been going on, uh, which is really, it, it kind of fits on the governance side because only one executive passed. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. But uh, yeah, we don't have a guest today, uh, which is totally fine because I think we, we could use the extra time to do some cool stuff. Uh, we're, I'm going to go through governance first. Uh, go through some partnerships, go through uh, some of the stuff that uh, we at the foundation released, uh, including the new updated white paper. Uh, we, I'm going to go through some highlights from the community. Uh, and then eventually, towards the end, uh, I've, I've been... I've been fantasizing about doing this, but uh, every week we have an awesome guest and we don't have enough time to do it. But uh, I think this week, today, we're going to do like a system segment of the week. So uh, we're going to be going, hopefully, at the end of the call through the VAT and the VOW. Uh, and these two are, uh, are smart contracts in the Maker Protocol that are part of the core of the Maker Protocol. And I'll explain kind of what they do. Uh, and I'll share my screen and kind of like you'll see the, the diagram of the system and, and hopefully it'll be like educational and you guys and people who are watching uh, might learn a little bit uh, more about the technical side of the system. Uh, all right, cool. So here's what I'm gonna do. Also, uh, this call is like super laid back. So feel free at any point to like interrupt me, uh, ask questions. Uh, if you don't have a mic, just ask it in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, happy, happy to have conversations on here. Uh, yeah, when I get into a monologue, it's like the feedback is nice, you know, it's it's nice. All right, cool. So I'm going to present uh, one of my windows now. And actually, I'll share this link with you guys so that you can uh, you can follow along. You could, you know, bookmark links. You could do whatever uh, you need to do. But yeah, here's the link to the agenda again. Uh, and so, yeah, here we go. So February 25th, uh, TLDR. So we had uh, an executive vote that passed. Uh, oh, no, I didn't put the date. Well, I think it passed, uh, what was it? Uh, I think it was like Saturday or Sunday it passed. Either way, uh, very recently, uh, there was a, a big bundled executive vote that passed, which uh, which did a few things, right? So it activated, well, you know what? I'm going to read through these points. So, oh yeah, there, <laughs> there's the date. Okay. Uh, it was executed on the 21st. So that was actually on Friday, not Saturday. Uh, and it was executed with 88,000 MKR. And uh, the other governing executive proposal still had around 80,000 MKR. So like right now, we're seeing very high levels of MKR uh, engagement with the, the governance of the system. Uh, and I think this was a result of the uh, flash loan uh, exploit on BZX. Uh, and actually a ton of people, not a ton of people, but a ton of maker was, uh, MKR was withdrawn from like Uniswap and like a ton of people piled into the uh, governance contract to prevent uh, and to better secure the system, to prevent from a flash loan attack. Uh, and Actually, uh, I think there is a whole new site called mkr.fyi. I, I forgot who made it, but it was just a quick uh, heuristic site. But you could see how much MKR is on the hat. And if you don't know what the hat is, the hat is just uh, the current governing proposal. So for a new vote to pass or any changes to the system to be made, uh, you need more MKR than this. Uh, basically. And then uh, this is how much uh, MKR liquidity there is available, I think, on Uniswap. Oh, no. I guess this is total, yeah, and this is Uniswap. And then this is how much is available on Aave for flash loans. So clearly not enough to do a flash loan attack on us. And also there's another reason why you can't do a flash loan attack on us because, uh, and I'll go through these after, but this is the one that's really, really uh, kind of the, the biggest uh, the, the biggest point of, of note uh, in governance this week is that the governance uh, security module, uh, which uh, institutes a delay to the system was uh, set to 24 hours. Uh, so it's been set uh, at zero, 
uh, with the launch of the system. And so it was set at zero, uh, mostly because there was a trade-off, right? Uh, that if you had a delay and there was a critical bug, there was no uh, like predefined good solution to fix the bug without exposing it uh, in the code for tw uh, for 24 hours. And in those 24 hours, somebody would have been able to exploit it, right? So uh, it was the decision of uh, the foundation and the risk team and kind of everybody, uh, uh, we, we kind of proposed it to the community in the migration parameters uh, that it would be set to zero for this reason. And the community uh, totally understood the reasoning and went with it. Uh, and so for the first basically three months, the first uh, quarter, uh, the governance security module delay was set to zero. Uh, but in the last, uh, uh, I guess, about a month ago or two months ago in, de in December, people, uh, uh, I think it was Mika who released the, the paper about attacking governance uh, and needing not a lot of money to do it. And so like the GSM was a very popular kind of... Uh, uh, point of contention in the Twitterverse and not really in the community because I think the second that people got like weirded out about the fact that it's at zero, not 24 hours like the original roadmap said it should be, uh, pe people realized the trade-off, which I, I just mentioned with the whole bug thing. Uh, and luckily, we, uh, not luckily, but diligently, uh, so uh, we actually uh, came up with a, a pretty cool, elegant solution uh, which is linked over here. It's the dark fix mechanism. And it sounds spooky and scary, but really it's just a way to obscure uh, the actual code and to have it like uh, pre-audited by a few uh, technically sound and trusted MKR holders uh, before actually uh, launching it. And you could you could do the dark fix with the 24-hour uh, delay and, and you'll be able to basically avoid the, the code for the fix being exposed to the public during this 24 hours. So it's a uh, it's it's a cool little solution that we made so that we could do the governance uh, delay. Uh, all right, cool. So yeah, that that's kind of one of the major things that happened this week. Uh, the other four changes that were part of this executive were that uh, the debt ceiling was raised by twenty five million. So now uh, you can create one hundred and fifty million die from ETH. Uh, the bat debt ceiling stayed the same, so it's still at three million. Uh, the die savings rate spread was set to 0%, uh, which I believe before was ha uh, 50 basis points, half a percent, which is why you saw it at 7.5% uh, before Friday, and now it's at 8. Uh, the size stability fee in single collateral, single collateral die uh, was set to 9.5%. I think that went up by 50 basis points or a percent. I can't really remember, but it did go up. Uh, so slowly but surely... Uh, People got to pay their stability fees on Psi, uh, which I don't think there's. N never mind. Uh, if you're interested in actually the metrics behind a uh, single collateral die, I highly encourage you to check out. Uh, I believe it was this last, no, not not last week's uh, governance call, but the week before that. I think it's episode 73 or 72. Uh, Primo Cordes uh, did a wonderful analysis of uh, the 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 final CDPs that are. In single collateral die, their activity, how much debt they have. Uh, I think it. I think uh, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head, it's something like a the top hundred CDPs own like ninety percent of the side debt, and like eighty or ninety percent of those have been inactive for like eight or eight to ten months or something like that. Uh, I can't rem remember the exact details, so take that with a grain of salt. But I encourage you. There's uh, summaries up, and I could actually link you to them. Uh, if you'd like, uh, but yeah, after the call, I'll actually link to it. But yeah, so ch yeah, moving on. Uh, size stability fee was raised, and then f uh, finally, we did something uh, experimental. Uh, also, so we lowered the minimum surplus auction bid to two percent. So it actually used to be three percent. And uh, if I can show you, uh, actually, oh no. Here you go. Here, dieauctions.com. If you don't know about the site, this is a really cool uh, site made by one of our community members, uh, uh, Marto. And so here, here's the surplus auctions. And this is the minimum bid increase. So basically what this is, is when people are, when the system is auctioning off 10,000 die for MKR, people bid an MKR. And, uh, and there's a minimum bid increase of 3%. So basically the first person to bid 
within 3% of the actual price is probably going to win. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so we decided to reduce that and see, see what it does. If it's too low, there's obviously like uh, price risk because it, it, there's like a minimum of, uh, what is it, 30 minutes? Or, yeah, yeah, thir yeah, 30 minutes before like uh, an auction can complete. So there's a bit of price risk if you, if you uh, come too close to the current price. So there should always be kind of like a bit of a minimum. And you could see that at least in the last 3.14 days, uh, these three surplus auctions all ended with this one almost three percent, one point eight percent, one point eight percent. So, so it's been really cool, and we're uh, and the purpose of this was to see if more uh, bidders would emerge or how it would change the behavior of these auctions. And so far, it it uh, it actually changed the behavior in favor of maker holders by making the spread uh, a little bit smaller, uh, which uh, is good for MKR holders. Because <clears throat> more MKR, a little bit more MKR gets burned. Uh, but yeah, really cool kind of experimental governance happening here. Um, and I believe that there's a thread somewhere talking about this. If if not, there probably will be soon. Uh, but yeah, so that is the executive vote that passed on Friday. Uh, there's a, a handful of governance polls. Uh, this is the one uh, that's notable from last week. Uh, and then these four are the ones that are running right now. So the one from last week was, uh, should we suspend monetary policy votes uh, when there are emergency technical changes to be made to the system? Uh, so like if there is a, a rework of the chief or a bug somewhere, uh, and then at the same time, we're, we're voting to like increase the stability fee and increase the debt ceiling. Should those things be bundled? And uh, and and I, the sentiment in the forums and the community was that you know no, they shouldn't because uh, if there is a disagreement on the monetary policy side, then you know it's uh, it's very, it's likely that uh, an emergency technical change that was bundled with it wouldn't change wouldn't pass. You know, uh, so we made the we made the decision as a community. To put it up to a governance poll and uh, and have people vote with uh, with their MKR with their the skin that they have in the game, and it passed with a yes, which reflected the community sentiment in the forums. So uh, we will be suspending monetary policy votes whenever there is an emergency technical change that needs to be made to the system, and uh, and in the actual poll, it's important to note that uh, how you define emergency technical change is actually up to the uh, smart contracts team and the technical team at the foundation. Uh, and so the community uh, was comfortable with this and voted in yes. So at the moment, that's what's going on. Uh, and also the governance security module delay to 24 hours was not considered an emergency, just for the record. That's why it was bundled up with everything else. Uh, so yeah, that happened, passed yes. And uh, yeah, so moving on. Uh, these are the four, oh, sorry, five governance polls that are happening this week. Uh, the first four are the usual. Uh, well, actually, the first three are the usual. These are the stability fee adjustments and the DSR spread adjustment. Uh, the uh, size stability fee is currently no change is winning, so nothing's going to happen if if this uh, wins out. Uh, same thing for the die stability fee. The current winning option is, is no change. And then for the DSR spread, uh, the a one percent is actually winning. So right now it's at zero percent, which is why you're seeing an eight percent DSR uh, and an eight percent stability fee at the same time. Uh, if this wins and the stability fee stays at eight percent, you're going to see the DSR drop to seven percent. Uh, so just a heads up. And there's a uh, twenty six thousand MKR versus a hundred on this. So it, it looks pretty strong right now. But of course, there is a couple of days to still wait. Uh, to see on the results. Uh, and then <clears throat> the debt ceiling adjustments. So th this is a yes and no, yes or no poll. And uh, it's uh, it's actually, you know, I'll pull it up because I didn't actually write the details of it. Uh, but the risk team is proposing that we uh, raise the die from ETH debt ceiling, I believe, and to lower the side debt ceiling. I might be wrong. Oh no, yeah, yeah, here it is. Sorry, I'm I am wrong. So uh, we're voting to lower the side debt ceiling by five million to twenty five million side. This is to just keep a really tight uh, ceiling so that uh, there's a lot less risk. I need to be able to articulate a little bit better the risk side of of uh, why the recommendation was exactly this. Uh, but 
uh, perhaps I, I can get Cyrus to 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 uh, to write me something that I could tell you guys next week. But uh, and then the other part of it was that uh, the uh, we were going to lower the die ETH debt ceiling by twenty million to one hundred and thirty million. So right now it went up to one hundred and fifty. Uh, so here, let me pull up die stats. So right now uh, the ETH debt ceiling is one hundred and fifty. And before it was, uh, I believe, uh, 125. Uh, and we were coming really close to 125 when we voted it up to 150. But since uh, Die from ETH actually dropped this week, uh, we're going to be voting it down to keep a tighter spread uh, between these two numbers. Uh, and that's totally a risk measure. And uh, if this, you know, when this grows again, uh, this will be increased again uh, in parallel. Uh, yeah, so, and this is a yes or no vote. And yeah, I, I could try to explain it. So uh, Akiva's asking me to explain it. I'll try to do that. And currently winning is 16K MKR versus uh, seven single MKR. Uh, so, so in regards to lowering the debt ceiling and keeping a tighter spread, uh, so, so okay, so the way that Cyrus described it from, from my memory, and I hope I don't butcher this, is that uh, right now, although the governance delay is set to 24 hours in multi-collateral die, uh, it's not set. There is no governance delay in single collateral die. Uh, and what this means is that people can technically just mint a ton of, you know, they could do an attack on Psy, mint a ton of Psy, and migrate it into MCD. So there is still some like flash loan governance attack risk. Uh, and actually, we're going to be talking about it this week. Uh, and actually, I was going to mention it in a, in a little bit. Uh, right somewhere there, but it doesn't matter. So the the whole thing is, if you have too much of a buffer between the actual supply and the ceiling, uh, it just uh, it's just a higher risk for people to uh, to mint a ton of dye and you know affect the market price. Uh, but again, don't take my word for it. I'm not on the risk team. Uh, I'm only trying to recall from memory the the exact thing that Cyrus was saying. Uh, but if you are interested in why, uh, you could actually take a look at uh, last week's governance call. And I think uh, it's there in the summary, a little bit of the argument. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to actually... Uh, an explanation, yeah. So I will try to get a little bit of a better explanation for this uh, next week. Uh, but it is a risk measure. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, the community is converging on keeping uh, and trusting the risk team that that we should keep uh, tight spreads. Uh, and since you know we can adjust the debt ceiling week to week, it really is not too bad to have a tight spread because even if we hit the debt ceiling, as we've seen it hit like several times in the past, uh, usually it it doesn't like stay there. You know, a bit of die gets paid back. There's a few million under, hits the ceiling again, and it kind of floats around there. And then on Friday, when the executive comes out, uh, it's usually passed and a raise is happens. But in this special case, you know, the die supply actually dropped. So, uh, and actually, uh, let's make her burn.com. Yeah, it is. Okay. So actually, so here, maybe I could show you guys. Uh, here's the die supply. So the die supply, <clears throat> on the 15th was at 148. This is the die plus size, so let's just do just the die supply. Okay, so it was at 126 million, and then it dropped to 120. So when it was at that, was it 126? Yeah, it, when it was at 126, it was, uh, we, were, we were, it. yeah, we, we decided to raise it to 125. I think it was at 125. It was hitting the ceiling. We raised it. And then it just dropped. So we're lowering it just to by 10 million to 130 uh, to keep a good spread. But yeah, so here's something in the chat. Let me just read it out. Uh, Richard James Lopez says, I think that's a pretty accurate synopsis. The only reason Psy is slightly vulnerable to being taken over and minting is because it is a permission token from DAI, not a separate token with its own governance. I'm not 100. Is that actually correct? I know. Bartek might be on the call. I know Brian's on an, on another call today. Uh, Chris is also here. If if one of you guys wants to uh, to just confirm that or correct that or yeah, feel free to. But but yeah, good comment. Good comment, Richard. Also, Ed's in here. 
right. I think you're muted, Ed. I saw I saw you do a shrug thing. Oh no, Ed left. I think he's gonna be back in a sec. Uh, either way, okay. So, oh, welcome back. I think you're still muted though. Here, let me see. That's because I'm not talking. Oh, okay, cool. I thought you I thought you were gonna say something. My bad. No, my bad. no comment. Okay, cool. Uh, now I'm muted. Okay. Uh, so yeah, moving forward, uh, the debt ceiling adjustments currently winning yes. So we're gonna lower it to have uh, a bit of a tighter spread. Uh, <clears throat> And then the last governance poll that's uh, happening right now uh, is should we reduce the frequency of the DSR spread governance poll to once per month? So this uh, this was actually, you know, this, this poll happens every week. Uh, and in the community, we had a, uh, a signal request thread in, in, the, uh, in the forums to kind of talk about this. And we talked about it uh, a bit on the governance calls as well. Uh, do we need to pull for the, sp the spread every week? You know, uh, can we reduce it? I, the whole purpose of changing the manual uh, setting of the DSR to setting the spread instead was so that it would lower the overhead for governance and so that we can vote on it less in theory. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, the current winning option is no uh, with 26,000, that same 26,000 MKR uh, versus the 300 that's for it. Uh, which is really interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna be super curious to hear people's theories on this and uh, and kind of uh, what's gonna go on. Akiva says he thinks it'll still pass. Uh, totally possible. There's there's a lot of MKR out there. There's currently I think 200k some uh, something like that in the voting contract. So you know it's very possible this will be turned. Uh, and it's you know we still got two days. So but it's still interesting nevertheless. Like I would be curious to hear the person's reasoning. Uh, for wanting to do it every week, it might be like a, a risk thing, right? Being able to be flexible and fast, if you know, if the need arises. Uh, but who knows? Uh, either way, uh, these are the current governance polls. If you're an MKR voter, go out and vote. Uh, definitely useful. Uh, the summary for of Thursday's risk and governance call uh, was put out uh, yesterday, so definitely check that out. Big thank you to Tim Black and uh, Igor Tesla for uh, doing the summaries. Uh, yeah, if anybody's interested, actually, I'm going to do a quick shout out. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, if you if you watch the governance call and you feel that you're, you'd be interested in uh, contributing and uh, helping with these summaries, definitely reach out to me. Uh, you know, these are compensated uh, gigs. Obviously, we believe people should be compensated for good work, and uh, and this is really important work. Uh, there's a huge emphasis on accuracy, semantic accuracy, uh, and and you know, kind of making things digestible in a way that doesn't require an hour and a half of watching a call. <laughs> so uh, so hit me up if you guys are interested in uh, guys or gals are interested in uh, in helping out with this. But yeah. We hope to make this uh, kind of a community-run, self-running thing in the future. Eventually, as the foundation steps further and further back, uh, Tim and Igor are both uh, community contributors. So it's going to be really cool to see myself step back and to have uh, the third piece of the puzzle, which is a quality assurance person who needs to have like the level of uh, understanding and like participation to actually uh, do do a good job at the quality assurance side of it. So. Definitely hit me up if you're interested in helping with the summaries of these calls. Uh, it's definitely needed. All right, so governance at a glance, as uh, many of you know, uh, and maybe some of you don't, this is a, a, a con uh, this is a thread in our forums that's constantly being updated uh, by Long for Wisdom, and I think a couple of the other admins, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, you could you could find kind of a snapshot of what's going on in governance, uh, and it's split up in these really uh, intuitive ways. There's a little bit of a summary at the top. There's active discussions. There's all the uh, signal request threads that are happening, uh, ongoing initiatives, and some help wanted stuff. So check that out. Uh, yeah, I, I listed a few things here that I thought were the most relevant to this week. So uh, right now, the uh, signal request thread that's most relevant is uh, whether or not to add ranked choice voting as an option for governance polls. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, I believe the argument was uh, 
if there is ranked choice voting, if you could just choose your first preference, second preference, third preference, and fourth, uh, there's a bit of a stronger signal in regards to what people are willing. It's not binary. It, it creates a bit more of a, a spectrum uh, for uh, adjusting things. So it, it's a bit more flexible. There's there's a ton of pros. Uh, there's if I can't I can't really remember uh, the cons for it, but I believe yeah. There's yeah. So Sam uh, Hexanot did a great job uh, kind of explaining it, uh, linking to a bunch of stuff. So. Uh, and getting people to vote. So you see 20 people on the forums have voted on this already. Uh, but regardless, uh, check it out. Uh, the pros are simple to imp implement, simple, simple to reason. Uh, and then the cons are, uh, it may skip over the second or third choice if they're eliminated before your third choice. And then Condorcet fixes this, which is a different uh, method. Oh no, didn't mean to click that. Apologies. Yeah, so check that out. Uh, Pretty interesting, C could be an improvement. Uh, next is Long for Wisdom's governance initiative updates. Uh, so Long is a, a total community rock star. He's he's been has has his hand in a ton of stuff that he's helping with, uh, and these are kind of the three. So he's been helping with the Proto FireMaker analytics uh, dashboard. He's been helping with uh, experimenting with the source cred model uh, for like uh, tracking people's contributions and uh, trying to establish like. Uh, like a compensation thing with regards to that data. Uh, and then also he's been helping in with the risk team, uh, Matote and Planet X on the collateral onboarding process, uh, which uh, is really cool. And so if you want uh, a bit more info, just check out this thread. Uh, I th yeah, I think uh, be good. Uh, this I mentioned earlier. It's uh, uh, Will Barnes, who's on the foundation, uh, who's at the foundation, posted uh, an explanation of the dark fix, all of the details. So if you're curious about this, go read. Uh, the dark fix isn't something that goes to a vote. It's more of uh, kind of like a mechanism that just handles like a, it's kind of like a process thing. But of course, there is stuff to vote on, uh, as Rich very accurately pointed out on last week's governance call. For example, like which MKR holders get the privilege of like auditing the fix before it's actually public or done. Like, who keeps the who keeps the smart contracts team in check, basically, and a few other things. But uh, and obviously, this is an imperfect fix. It's t it it is temporary. There will be improvements to handling bug fixes with the presence of a delay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, super interesting read. <clears throat> Check it out if you have some time. Uh, there was a question uh, because of this whole uh, resurfacing of Prog POW in the Ethereum community of whether MKR governance should get involved with Ethereum hard, hard forks. And so this is a thread Cyrus posted that I thought was really interested. Uh, and it was prompted, I think, by what I saw was a, a tweet that basically said, you know, if Ethereum forks, it, it you know, the, the DeFi protocols have a lot of uh, say because, you know, they they really uh, have have a huge real usership and and uh, and market share. So uh, this is where the conversation started. I didn't read any of it yet, so um, definitely check it out. It's an interesting question. Uh, there's a call going on right now about using tranches to ensure against defaults of real world assets and providing an extremely stable asset. So this is a, a bit of the meta. It's building on the meta of eventually having real world assets on the maker protocol. Uh, and this is kind of uh, has to do with the recourse mechanism because for the maker protocol to work well with uh, real world assets, there has to be an ability to liquidate them and to uh, ensure that you know we can recover the funds on a defaulted position. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think that uh, these guys are are kind of doing a bit of a proposal. And there was a call that's happening today uh, at the same time as this community call. And it is it is recorded. So hopefully it, they'll put it up on YouTube so people like me can watch it later. People like you might. Uh, but I definitely want to check that out because it might be interesting, right? It might be uh, a, good, uh, a good model for real world asset liquidations uh, and ensuring that uh, there's less expected losses, right? Uh, and then the last uh, kind of uh, form thread that I thought was really interesting uh, was how to audit executive contract code. Uh, and this is really important for like non-technical maker holders. Uh, I think that I forgot who the who the 
who the community member was who posted this. Oh yeah, Joshua. So yeah, Joshua posted this up and kind of uh, was asking for a cheat sheet. You know, uh, you know, it's easy enough to see the the change because it's open source uh, when it's you know put up to the to the proposal. Uh, but there's like there's no cheat sheet. There's no easy tutorial to kind of understand. And if there's regular changes being made to the code, uh, like it it should be. A, a, it should make sense to have like a bit of a cheat sheet. So this is kind of cool. I like this initiative. Uh, it's obviously super new, uh, and obviously it might might take a while before something like that exists. But I definitely think uh, it's important for uh, any MKR token holder and actually any person in general to be able to quickly and efficiently like audit uh, an executive uh, vote. You know, because ultimately, you know, what you're reading on the on our, you know, the Maker Foundation's voting portal or some other third party voting portal might not actually be accurate. You know, there might be mistakes, you know, and it's important to have that feedback mechanism so that that could be caught in time if there is a mistake. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah, that's that's about it for governance. Uh, definitely feel free to, to jump in and let me know if I missed anything. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through the next piece, uh, partnerships, integrations, grants. I think these are all just partnerships uh, this week, in the last two weeks. So uh, Co Coinbase Commerce announced DAI support, really cool. OwnBit uh, now has a better support for MakerDAO's DAI, which is uh, the, uh, yeah, they have a cold wallet and multi-sig uh, uh, accessibility with DAI now. So it's now supported by default, uh, which is good. Uh, the Bikey, Bikey Mining Pool uh, launched the DSR with MakerDAO. Uh, not 100% sure on the de details of that, but feel free to read if you're interested. Uh, CryptoMat uh, partnered with us to bring a new NFT hero to our game. So uh, say hello to D Daenerys Vaultborn, uh, the burner of volatility. Uh, here, I'll read the whole thing. The burner of volatility, the keeper of collateral, the redeemer of blockchains, and mother of hodlers, unfearing in the face of uh, immoral imposters, a worthy and well, clearly very well fed uh, companion who in times of despair will fight to protect your righteously earned assets. Uh, and if you're curious, here's like a little video of this of this guy. I just, I think this is so entertaining, but uh, he like, he like spits out little, little dies and he like follows you around. So yeah, uh, really cool to see. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. Uh, really cool to see. Uh, this <laughs> it's it's pretty entertaining but whoever wrote this uh props to them because i love it being a being a game of thrones fan all right uh anyway uh moving forward yeah so that's about it for partnerships nothing too crazy uh we did release quite a lot on the blog and uh and in general so i guess the one of the biggest bigger things that has been waited on for a long time is an updated white paper uh and our team at the foundation has been tirelessly working uh you know since devcon in october to release some cd and like a ton of other things that uh we just have our hands totally full so this white paper it's a little bit delayed uh but nevertheless it is out uh and it's really wonderfully um Oh, I already had it open. It's really wonderfully kind of uh, uh, formatted, actually. You know what? Ha ha. Yeah. No, that's. Jeez. Okay. We're just gonna do it this way. Uh, I, was, I was I was actually trying to get to the actual white paper, not the blog post. But you know, there's a a huge kind of um, uh, what is it? Table of contents here on the left. Uh, and it's all updated from CD, so and you can download the PDF. And I think we have multi this in multiple language is incoming. So, uh, so yeah, white paper released, uh, which is cool. Uh, and then we also released uh, over the last two weeks. So this didn't all happen at once. Uh, the final one, two, three, four uh, blog posts uh, that belong to the Welcome to Crypto series. So uh, the Welcome to Crypto series is meant to target, you know, um, users and people who are interested in crypto who don't know anything about crypto. So, uh, so I guess I'll I'll, I'll kind of show you guys all of the different parts. But uh, finally, all six of them are released. So uh, the first one was the benefits of crypto and blockchain. Uh, the second one was how does crypto have value? Why should you care? The third one was uh, different types of cryptocurrencies explained. Uh, the fourth was a guide to wallets, and the fifth was uh, how to buy them. Uh, and then finally, the last one was how to read 
price charts and why they matter, right? Uh, especially for stable coins. You don't want your stable coins to, to not be stable. Uh, <laughs> but regardless, yeah, so this is a bit of an intro to crypto series that our team has been working on. Uh, and it's been really cool to see it pumped out so quickly and efficiently and awesomely. Uh, so check it out. Send those to your friends. Uh, if you have any that are not privy to crypto and who might be interested in doing some some light reading, these are meant to be easily digestible. So, uh, so definitely share them around if you're interested to do so. Uh, now coming on one of my favorite sections, some highlights from the community. Uh, Mike McDonald, who is the guy behind MKR.Tools, um, offers offered in the past, because uh, it was earlier this week, to fund a DeFi transparency dashboard. Uh, and I know guys like Chris Black, uh, actually, and I think I have it listed here s somewhere. If I didn't list it, I'll be upset, because I should have. But regardless, yeah, so uh, Mike wrote, you know, if you're looking to break into the Ethereum space as an engineer, there is a burning need for a DeFi transparency dashboard along with details of the admin capabilities, points of trust, oracles. It should also track like key on-chain events uh, for any use of admin functions and controls. So obviously, uh, over the, well, not obviously, but uh, over the last kind of few months, people have been understanding that DeFi, you know, is is an ideal, and a lot of these protocols are not fully decentralized. Uh, you know, uh, and so it's important to kind of take all of the individual pieces that comprise of, of a protocol uh, and to have a public disclosure and, and a place that's a, a really good central location to uh, to check that out for yourself. I know uh, Consensus's project uh, DeFi score tries to uh, to uh, rate protocols by risk, uh, which is which is good. Uh, but I think that even a higher level of transparency is important. Uh, and that's exactly what Mike was getting at. And if I don't have it here, but you know what? I bet I bet I could I bet I could pull it up really quickly because uh, I saw Chris Black uh, doing great stuff with regards to, to kind of pushing on this. Uh, DeFi watch. Yeah, here it is. Uh, yeah, so uh, Curated info on all things DeFi security and risk. It's going to be adding more soon, but but yeah. So here's uh, kind of some stuff. It's already being started, uh, but things like this, you know, a dashboard that that uh, talks about the real risks, the real technical risks, and various risks of uh, of DeFi protocols. So super important. Uh, Adrian put out another weekly Maker Holder Digest. It does like a, a brief recap. Uh, good if you're a voter. If you don't have too much time, you just want a quick uh, quick look over. Uh, he, I think he posted that on Reddit and the forum. And you could also find it here in the agenda every week. So uh, we've had, oh, oh yeah. So this is actually really cool. Uh, we've been running the uh, micro granting program at the foundation for meetups uh, for about a year now. Uh, and we, you know, it's slowly but surely been ramping up. And uh, and this month, uh, in February, we've had over 30 applications. Uh, and I believe we funded like 20 or like 20-something 20, 20 of them. Uh, and then the other ones are just kind of pending. And there's maybe two or three rejections. Uh, but regardless, it's really exciting. And like one great example of this uh, is Sahabia. And he's been one of our, actually one of our first meetup grantees. And he's been doing these regular meetups in Ghana. Uh, and it's been a total pleasure to see uh, him and his community grow. Uh, and so, yeah. And the diversity, by the way, of where these meetups are, we've, we've had meetups in Qatar, in London, in New York, in Canada, in Buenos Aires, you know, in uh, uh, Kukuta, in, in like, uh, in Korea and the Philippines and uh, in Japan, like we've been funding, uh, meetups all over the world with this program and it's been really exciting to see so if you or anyone you know is uh is interested in getting some funding for a meetup related to maker die DeFi, uh check out uh this link right here uh and see how you could do a really quick uh a really quick uh form application uh that's reviewed by us and then uh and yeah if it's all kosher we uh we do the grant and you have a good event and uh and it's good so yeah moving forward 
uh, some developer uh, creations. So uh, die auctions, that's not correctly spelled. So actually, I think I could just pull it up here because there's some. Oh, I guess I added the changes there, so never mind. All right, so yeah, so the die auctions website added the uh, medianizer price reference. It added the the bin, you know, like so. I showed it earlier on the call, but up top those little boxes. Uh, that's basically what he added. A bunch of new information. So really cool to see that. Uh, so Chris Mooney, uh, actually at ETH Denver. Uh, worked with the RenVM team, who, if you guys don't know about RenVM, they're trying to do uh, Bitcoin on Ethereum, uh, just like uh, TBTC and WBTC, but obviously uh, their uh, their model is different. Uh, and uh, Chris Mooney uh, came to ETH Denver to, uh, one of the main reasons he came to ETH Denver is what he said was to kind of meet the team and, and work with them on uh, on a hack. And, uh, and they did a uh, MakerDAO BTC Vault demo. So if you're interested, check that out. Uh, so also DeFi Snap allows users to watch multiple addresses. Cool new feature. DeFi Saver uh, added a really easy uh, feature to let you transfer your Maker Vault. I know that on the current Oasis Borrow interface, I don't think there, I don't know if there is a, an easy send button because I remember on the CDP manager, the one that used to be hosted on cdp.maker.com, uh, MakerDAO.com. Uh, it used to have like a send button, but uh, but regardless, now you could have another option to send your Maker Wallet through. Uh, all right, coming 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 to the tail end here of uh, of some of the agenda. Uh, some really cool articles happened over the last couple of weeks. I didn't list all of them because I didn't want to like exhaust you guys with my monologue about articles. But here's a few of them. Uh, the decentralized financial crisis uh, attacking DeFi. So, so some of the numbers here are a little different because they obviously change like day to day. Uh, but it's a really good academic paper. Uh, if you're interested in reading it, check it out. It's actually not an article; it's an academic paper. Uh, we were uh, Maker made it to the FinTech 50 of 2020. Uh, the newcomers, which was exciting. Uh, there was a great post by. Uh, Ryan Sean Adams, how to do DeFi taxes. It's obviously like non-exhaustive, but uh, if you're like me and you're stressed out about how the hell to report, like you know, your vault usage or like your DSR gains or and, you know things like that, uh, give it a read. Uh, might be useful. And then uh, uh, I think uh, I forgot who this was. Who was the author? I want to give credit. You know. Oh yeah, uh, Pay uh, Patri. Uh, did a little bit of a, of an explainer of how to open a die savings account if you're a Canadian. So, yeah, super simple. Uh, all right, some notable threads. Uh, a lot of these, some of these are Twitter, some of these are Reddit. Uh, so there was a Twitter thread on Teams projects working on educating users in DeFi. Uh, like one of the one of like the uh, the first names that comes to mind is like guys like Chris Black. Uh, but regardless, if, if you're looking for more educational resources, you can. Oh no, suspended account. That's not good. Oh well, I guess. Uh, guess. <laughs> I guess that thread's gone. Okay, never mind. I'm just gonna that real quick. But yeah, if you saw, there's Ethic Hub. There's there's uh, Chris. There's there's a ton of other people. But uh, hopefully, a better thread comes out with a little bit more. But you know, educating users is super important in the space. Uh, other notable threads, there's a tweet storm, tweet storm on flash loans and their implications. Really interesting read. Uh, there was a thread on what's the point of taking a decentralized loan uh, on Reddit. Uh, this was, there's a lot of good comments in there. Uh, why can't the stability fee be automated? You know, we live in a world of technology. Shouldn't we just institute some sort of like PID mechanism that like automatically uh, adjusts the stability fee? Uh, the the short answer is that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nuance there that could lead to it being gamed and it's simply just not ready to be automated. Uh, and then there's other arguments for why people believe that there should always be some sort of uh, human element of control to it. Uh, but regardless, this is kind of like a rolling issue, and there's a ton of really great conversation in that thread. So check it out. Uh, what's up with the sudden drop in locked ETH and Maker? Is it related to the Eric.eth posts? Ooh. Uh, well, 
actually, uh, I think that Bashesh covered it uh, a bit in the last governance call, but uh, the uh, I think a part of it, uh, a part of the uh, a part of the withdrawal of this collateral went to compound, and then another part kind of was just withdrawn. Period. Uh, it was unclear why. Uh, I can't really remember exactly what Vishesh said. Uh, it's one of those Tuesday mornings for me. Uh, but regardless, uh, check it out. Click on it. There's there's a, a ton of great uh, convo in there that'll give you a better answer than I can right now. Uh, are there still people with uh, the old CDP who haven't uh, migrated to the new MCD? What are the risks and how long do we have? Uh, so this was a great question from a community member. Check it out if you currently have a CDP. Uh, and if you're curious about what the risks are. Uh, lastly, there's uh, should I put 100 grand of DAI into the DAI savings rate? Uh, a little bit of uh, exploration into the risks, into whether it makes sense, uh, into just a bunch of the, the nuance in that question. So check it out. Uh, all right, a few videos. Uh, the Kraken Intelligence and the Maker Foundation webinar. I forgot exactly what, what this was. I think it was just, yeah, it's, yeah, it was like a full one hour uh, sit down with Greg, who's our head of BD. Uh, and yeah, they kind of uh, followed the release of MCD. I think they cover a bit about the migration, things like that. I haven't watched it yet, so forgive me. Uh, Peter was mentioning uh, before I hit the record button on the call, uh, Mariano, Mariano Conti's talk, uh, the day of the flash loan exploit on BZX, uh, and uh, and how he you know made a call out to the DeFi community of how DeFi still is in its infancy and that we have to take these kinds of things seriously and that we uh, yeah just a ton of really good stuff in this talk uh, and he points out oh yeah he lists all of the risks uh, of the Maker protocol. Uh, transparently, like one by one, and and I think he even said like there's other risks, you know. But uh, check out that talk. Uh, it's not too long. Uh, it starts at three hours and twenty four minutes into the stream. Uh, so yeah. Oh, uh, lastly, Maker DAO: Power of Blockchain Technology to Make Digital Currency Stable. Uh, yeah, it's just a short video. Uh, yeah, I think it's just like a promo type video. Yeah. Usually don't add those, but I thought maybe maybe what happened was I watched it and I was like, oh, this is cool. Uh, but either way, check it out if you wanna if you wanna hype yourself up. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, that's about it. Just a couple of real life events happening this week. Uh, one's happening today in London, in the UK. Uh, Tech London Advocates. So we got Gustav there representing, uh, and I think he's talking there too. And then a couple days later, Gustav again is going to be doing another. Uh, meet up in London, a meet and chat with uh, Mel Important Aztec. And if you guys don't know, I actually mentioned this two weeks ago, but Aztec uh, did their first 10,000 ZK die, uh, which is uh, really interesting. Aztec is doing private uh, Ethereum transactions, which uh, I know is a, a huge uh, kind of value point in the in the community is the the right to be able to do private transactions and uh, and yeah. Aztec is doing good work on that. Mainnet private die transactions would be really cool. All right, right on. So with 10 minutes to spare, uh, I'm going to just pause here for a second before I, I get into uh, the, the system segment of the week that I'm so excited for. Uh, but Akiva said that uh, the video, the one hour video uh, with Kraken uh, was amazing. Uh, that is actually prompting me to uh to to go watch it with my lunch so <laughs> uh that that is what i will be watching while i'm eating in about an hour uh okay cool yeah if anybody has any questions or anything feel free to for, feel free to ask i'm just gonna pause here for a second catch my breath drink a little bit of coffee all right you guys are silent so I'll take that as a, as a signal. Uh, all right, so let's do the system segment of the week. Uh, this bad boy right here, actually, I'm going to, and tell me, ah, no, no. Uh, hold on. Can I open it? No, it does it here. Do you guys see uh, this? Uh, 
Do you guys see the uh, the photos tab, or do you guys still see my uh, my the website? Blink once for website. Blink twice for uh, for for seeing the photo. Okay, I, browser. You only see the browser, right? Okay, whatever. Because the photo is a little bit higher quality, so like the browser is is just not not there uh, for whatever reason, but. Yeah, it's so odd why it's not like higher higher resolution. But either way, this is the very elegant and wonderful uh, diagram of all of the smart contracts in the maker protocol and the users. So uh, the boxes over here are smart contracts. Well, actually, you could see the index here. A few boxes aren't actually smart contracts. Uh, think like for example, oh no, I guess the IOU is the smart contract for the IOU MKR token, but whatever. Getting into details that are not relevant for right now. But the two things we're going to be talking about today are this big bad boy right here, the VAT, uh, and this little bad boy right here, uh, which is actually still a big, big bad boy, uh, the VAL. Uh, and the VAL and the VAT are part of uh, the, uh, the core module of the Maker Protocol. And the core module, I'm just kind of going to read it. Uh, and feel free to stop me if you want clarification. I know there's a few people from the foundation uh, on the call. So they, they probably would be happy to clarify stuff if I miss anything or get something wrong. So the core module, it's crucial to the system as it contains the entire state of the maker protocol and controls the central mechanisms of the system while it's in the expected normal state of operation. Uh, so, so we're, yeah, I opened it up here. So here's the VAT, right? This is this big uh, central piece of the diagram. So the VAT, it's kind of the core uh, vault engine of the maker protocol. Uh, yeah, Ed posted the, the full image if you want to pull it up yourselves. Uh, so it stores vaults and tracks all of the associated die and collateral balances. Uh, it also defines the rules by which uh, vaults and balances can be manipulated. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, the rules defined in the VAT are immutable, uh, so you can't change them. Uh, and in some sense, the rules in the VAT can be viewed as like the constitution of the protocol. So it's very kind of like, it's almost like the central accounting system uh, of the protocol. But there is uh, a bit of a secondary, uh, not a secondary accounting system, but it's kind of part of the accounting system, which is the VAL. Uh, uh, but really quickly, here's all of the, the wonderful language that people hate so much. But uh, inside of the contract, there, there's all, all of these kind of variables, like uh, the gem, which is different collateral tokens. Like there's different gems, like there's BAT, there's ETH, right? Uh, there's DAI, which is uh, stable coins, and then there's SYN, which is like unbacked stable coins. So, uh, for example, when you see when you are obsessively looking over at DAI stats, like I do, uh, you might have noticed that uh, right next to the uh, system surplus, right here, there's also debt available to heal right there, uh, and this debt uh, is actually SYN. Uh, so it's like almost like negative DAI, uh, and you can uh, launch a transaction to actually subtract the sin from the surplus die, the internal die. Uh, and yeah, and all of that, these balances are handled by uh, these core contracts, The uh, ultimately the VAT, and then secondarily the VAO, if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, and yeah, here's here's that transaction that I said, create, destroy equal quantities of stablecoin and system debt. So they, yeah, it's basically like subtracting your... Uh, liabilities from your assets in your business, kind of. That's like a good analogy. Uh, and by the way, Ed or Chris or anybody, feel free to like jump in if you guys have any like cool insights or, or points that you want to uh, add about uh, about these. Uh, and then really quickly, here's the vow. So uh, this is kind of a, a, a better kind of zoomed in uh, version of the diagram. So here's the VAT, here's the vow. Uh, and obviously the VAL can launch a heal transaction to the VAT and the VAT uh, updates all of the uh, token balances and all that good stuff. Uh, and obviously th there's a ton of other stuff. So like the flap uh, auction, which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the collateral auction also affects the VAT. The flop auction affects the VAT. Uh, and then the cat affects the VAT. And the cat uh, is, is actually a smart contract that... Uh, identifies and, and pulls uh, under collateralized CDPs into liquidation. So it grabs the CDP and then it kicks it 
and then it auctions it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's that. So let me read kind of the intro here. Uh, let me just see the chat. Cool. Okay, so the vow contract, it represents the Maker Protocol's balance sheet. So that's what I meant by secondarily. I think when I was trying to wrap my head around this, uh, I was a little bit confused about uh, the difference between the VAT balances and the vow balances. Uh, but let me read further. In particular, the vow acts as the recipient of both the system surplus and system debt. Its main functions are to cover deficits via uh, debt i.e. flop auctions. So this is when uh, MKR is actually issued to cover debt. Uh, and this happens uh, when this is at zero and this is at 50,000, which means that we're 50,000 in debt and uh, the system is either running at a deficit or just had like a really big expense, like a $550,000 plus expense that it just had to like get done right away or something like that. So basically, once this hits 50,000, we're 50,000 in debt, and a flop auction happens, uh, which is right here. Uh, and the flop auction uh, basically you know, creates uh, uh, creates MKR, sells it for DAI, and then the DAI, if I'm not mistaken, is moved to the, to the VAT. I don't know if that's right, actually. So it's important to state that the flop auction could only happen if we didn't have any surplus, right? If surplus yeah. was zero. So in the real world, we're only going to see those happen on Covan, right? We're never going to have a flop <laughs> auction on mainnet. Um, <laughs> well, that's what the risk team is for, is to make sure that we only have them on Covan. <laughs> so unfortunately, there's no there's no diestats.com pointed at Covan, but I believe mm -hmm. last time I checked, we were at a debt on Covan, and on Covan, there were opportunities to flop. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, cool. Uh, but so, uh, so Ed, in the smart contracts team, you guys tested this functionality on Koban, right? Like you guys, uh, uh, before MC was launched, uh, you guys kind of did. Did you guys st like stress test flop auctions? Well, um, first, I'm not on the smart contracts team, but oh, yeah. we actually had all of our, um, the, the different teams had their different tests. So the smart contract right. team had their own suite of tests. Um, when I was working on Auction Keeper, uh, I put together my own tests on a, a like a local test chain, mm -hmm. and that test chain is Dockerized. If anyone wants to uh, pull down that image from Docker Hub, there's actually a, a whole section in the Auction Keeper tests folder uh, under the folder manual, and there's documentation how to run those tests. But yeah, it was stress tested in both directions, both having surplus in the system and having debt in the system just to make sure that um, the, the keeper itself would interact properly with the contracts. Right. Yeah, my bad. I forgot that, that uh, you're the guy behind all the keepers. Not on not, not small contracts. My bad. I would, I would say all the keepers. Not all the keepers, but the, uh, the auction keepers primarily, right? Yes. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And that's something that I realized is that uh, it's it's less about the actual numbers and it's more about the behavior of the system. So like right now we're running a surplus, so we're obviously able to beat out the rate at which we're accumulating debt. And this debt comes from the money we owe on the DSR and also uh, I think one or two other sources, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, all right, cool. And so uh, here's kind of uh, let me. So yeah, I don't want to, I'm trying to think. So this is the first uh, system segment of the week section. We're about a minute left on the call. I did just want to do like a quick overview, uh, but there is a ton of detail in here and I highly encourage uh, anybody watching the call. Uh, if you're interested, go to docs.makerdow.com uh, and read for yourself. Everything is, you know, totally transparent and documented and, uh, and it's fascinating how it works. Uh, just the authorizations and the variables, and uh, it's a really, really elegant system uh, that works super intuitively. Uh, but regardless, I think there's a minute on the call left, so I'm gonna stop presenting my screen. And actually, if uh, if Ed, uh, if you wanna, if you have any other things that maybe might be important about the VAT or the VAL, uh, definitely feel free to. No, I mean, the only thing I can think to mention is that the system was designed in a modular fashion. So if at some point in the future we say that 
we think the right thing to do is to replace a section of those contracts. For example, we decide that flip isn't working the way we like and that we want to improve and go to a different auction structure. We can kind of switch out that flip contract with a different auction contract and um, we'd be able to do liquidations completely differently in the future. Um, yeah. And really, uh, really the VAT contract is um, kind of the whole center of the system. So that that's a bit more written in stone. So, so when it said that it's immutable, uh, is that kind of like a heuristic? Is it like technically immutable or it is mutable? Cause like I'm, my understanding about the chief, which is the smart contract that it's like the governance uh, auth that like gives you access to change things in the protocol. Uh, it gives it root access, no? Like technically you should be able to change the VAT. It's just, yeah. it's like highly like unadvised, not advisable, right? Well, no, is I that mean, it? when governance proposals go through the, I believe the chief has the ability to call file methods on the VAT contract to change okay. certain parameters for it. But as far as whether that can ever be replaced, you need to talk to someone on the smart contracts team to, um, yeah. Explain how that modularity works. Yeah, I, I, I would love to. I'd love to uh, dive into that immutability word. But cool. Yeah, right on. Thank you so much, Ed. You're welcome. All right. Well, with that, uh, and the few of you left here, uh, thank you for uh, joining us on the call. I hope uh, this was informative uh, and interesting. Uh, and I will see you guys next week. And I believe next week we're going to have uh, Nodar from DeFi Zap on the call. Uh, and I think the week after that, or in a couple of weeks, we're going to have uh, Ethic Hub. Uh, so stay tuned for those interesting guests. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the call. And definitely feel free to hit me up with any feedback or, or ideas you have for the call. Because I'm always looking for ways to make this more valuable, more interesting. Uh, yeah. So thank you guys. Hitting... Please stop recording now.